الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين welcome brothers and sisters to our program a light study of selected ahadith from al hafiz al nawawi's riyadh al salihin and we have reached the chapter entitled the chapter of repentance bab at tauba and at the outset of this chapter, Al-Hafidh al-Nawiyyu rahimahullah ta'ala does something which he does not typically do. He does it a few times throughout his book, but he gives a preface to the chapter. And in that preface, he um, talks about the ruling of repentance, uh, the basic conditions of repentance, as well as um, clarifies some difference of opinion regarding the issue some issues some finer points or nuances of repentance he clarifies the differences of opinion and provides what he considers to be the strongest opinion related to those differences it is a very good preface which gives a very um, concise overview of the issue uh, at hand the subject at hand before actually mentioning the hadith related to the subject of repentance and so because of its importance and the benefit contained in this preface um, I wanted to spend uh, the first few lessons of our discussion of this particular chapter commenting on that preface and so what I'll do is I'll read the preface and then we're going to take a part of it today and comment on it and then shall Allah in the coming days will complete the commentary so no way he says uh, and I'll read it in English because it's somewhat lengthy and then we'll do, go to the commentary. So he says, Scholars say, Repentance from every sin is obligatory. If the sin was merely between a person and Allah the Exalted, and does not involve the rights or property of another individual, then in such a case the conditions for acceptability are threefold. Cessation, total abandonment of the sin. Number two, to feel remorse for having committed it. And number three, to resolve and commit oneself to never return to it, ever. If a person's repentance lacks any one of these conditions, it will be invalid and unacceptable. If the sin involved another person, four conditions must be fulfilled. The preceding three conditions, in addition to returning the right taken from the other party or paying the appropriate restitution. If the sin involved a material possession, for example, it should be returned to its rightful owner. If it involves slander or something similar, then he must give the slandered the opportunity to take revenge or seek his forgiveness. If the sin was backbiting, he should make amends. Repenting from all sins is mandatory, but if a person repented from some of his sins, but not from others, his repentance from those sins would still be valid according to the people of the correct viewpoint but the other sins will remain in his account. Textual proofs from the book, the sunnah and unanimous agreement ijma of the Muslim community abound, all of which indicate the obligation of repentance. So it's a beautiful preface. Uh, as I said, he covers um, the ruling of repentance, the conditions for repentance, some of the particulars related to certain scenarios where a person would need to repent, and what would, what would be required of him, as well as um, a finer point where there is some difference of opinion in clarifying the correct view, and then closing again um, by talking about or repeating or reiterating the ruling of repentance as well as the sources for that ruling. Um, so he opens and he says, Scholars say repentance from every sin is obligatory. So he opens by saying, ulama, scholars say, and this is one of the ways that the scholars have typically uh, alluded to or indicated an ijma, unanimous agreement of the scholars. And as we'll see, the scholars of Islam, irrespective of their theological and or juristic schools, are all in agreement regarding the ruling of repentance. Then he says, atoba, repentance. Atoba, this word, this Arabic word, comes from Taba yatubu, which means to return. And when this word atoba is used in an Islamic legal context, it refers to a specific type or specific form of returning. 
as mentioned by as mentioned by Al Hafid Al Iraqi and Al Hafid Ibn Hajr, rahimahumullah Taala. Al Rujuwa it means Al Rujuwa, Al Maasiyat Allah, Ila Taati, returning from Allah's disobedience to His obedience. This is the specific meaning of a toba in the legal Islamic context. According to Ibn Al Qayyim, it means Al Rujuwa. عما يكرهه الله ويأباه إلى ما يحبه الله ويرضاه Returning from that which Allah hates and dislikes to that which He loves and is pleased with. And as you can clearly see at Tawbah, as you can clearly see from these two definitions, the definition of Al-Iraqi and Ibn Hajar, and the definition of Ibn Qayyim, that at Tawbah returning simultaneously necessitates a tarq leaving i.e. leaving sin and returning to obedience. So there can be no, this is a very important point for us to understand, there can be no repentance in Islam, legally, that is not accompanied by leaving the sin from which one intends to repent. A person cannot repent and still be committing the sin from which he is claiming to repent from. This is very important. Why? Because as you can see from the definitions given by the scholars, a toba in Islam, returning in Islam, requires also tuk, necessitates at the same time leaving, abandoning, returning to obedience and leaving the sin. Tayyip, he goes on, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he says, bin kulli them, repentance from every sin. Further along in the preface, he, 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 he says the same thing, he reiterates this, he restates this, but in a different, uh, with a different terminology. He says, and yatuba min jamia ad repenting from all sins. But here in both cases, a no-we or Himlaw Ta'ala is alluding to sins being divided into two, two categories, major and minor sins. And thereafter, he clarifies, in that same context, he clarifies that irrespective of whether the sin is major or minor, repentance is required from both types. Now on this issue, I'd like to point out that the Qur'an and the Hadith make it clear that not all sins are created equal. That the, the, what what uh, Anoe is alluding to, the presence of two degrees or two levels of sin, major and minor. This is something that he didn't just you know pull out of his pocket, or something that he didn't just think sounded good, but rather it's something which is supported by the Quran, the Hadith, and I wouldn't say the Ijma because I think there is some difference of opinion, um, but is supported by the Quran, the Hadith. They make it clear that the sins are not created equal, and that some sins are major, and some sins are minor. So for example, if we look at the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, says, وَوُذِيَ الْكِتَابُ فَتَرَ الْمُجْرِمِينَ مُشْفِقِينَ مِمَّا فِيهِ وَيَقُولُونَ وَيَقُولُونَ يَا وَيْلَتَنَا مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا إِلَى أَخِرْ الْآيَةِ Allah says, the record of deeds will be opened and placed before them. And you will see those guilty of crimes, fearful of what it contains, and they will say, O oh, woe to us, what kind of book is this? It neither omits a minor sin, or a ma I'm sorry, nor a major sin, except that it records it with impeccable precision. Notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions al-kaba'ir wa sagha'ir. In this ayah, mentions both types or both levels of sin. We also have the ayah from Surah Al-Najm, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ يَجْتَنِبُونَ كَبَائِرُ الْإِثْمِ وَالْفَوَاحِشِ إِلَّا الْلَّمَمْ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ, إن ربك وَاسِعُ الْمَغْفِرَةِ He says, for those who avoid the major sins and immoral acts, only committing lesser offenses, indeed your Lord is vast in forgiveness. Allah mentions the major sins and what the lesser offenses or the minor, the minor sins. We also have the hadith collected by Imam Muslim on the authority of Abu Hurairah, in which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "As-salawatul khams, wal jum'atu ila jum'ah, wa Ramadan ila ila Ramadan, mukaffirat li ma bayna hunna ida shtunibat kabair, ida ida shtunibat al kabair." Asif. He said, "The five daily prayers, one Friday prayer to the next, one Ramadan to another, all will expiate the sins committed in between them." So the sins committed in between, oh, sorry, the sins committed after one Ramadan will be expiated by what? The coming Ramadan. The sin committed after one prayer will be expiated by the prayer that follows it. And the sin committed after one Friday prayer will be expiated by the Friday prayer that follows it. 
if the major sins are avoided. Now, a person will ask, or a person might ask and say, um, or object and say, in no place in this hadith is the word sagira or sagair, minor sins, mentioned. So how can you say that this hadith is an indication that sins are major and minor? The answer is from two angles. The first angle is what we call mafhum at-taqseem. Mafhum at-taqseem. Mafhum at-taqseem basically means that if Allah or His Messenger mention um, a statement which indicates categorization, or the creation of what? Of levels and degrees. Even if they only mention one degree, what we understand from that, what that indicates, is that the other degree, what? The, 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 uh, the, uh, the corresponding or the counterpart degree or level or member of the category also must exist even if it goes unmentioned. And I'll give you a practical example. Um, let's say, for example, that um, you visited me in my home and a young man came down the steps um, to greet you. And I said to you, as this young man's coming down the steps to greet you, I said, this is my oldest son. And then you respond and you say, well, how many sons do you have? And I say, I only have the one. You would, you would say, that, that's ridiculous. If you say that you have an oldest, you automatically understand that I must have what? A younger one. In order for there to be an oldest, there has to be what? A youngest. There has to be that opposite counterpart because I've created what? I've given an indication that there is some type of what? Leveling, degreeing, or there's some type of what? Categorization. Even if I, if I only mention one member of the category. Tayyip, the same thing is true here in the Hadith where the Prophet said, If the major sins are avoided, must mean that there's something corresponding to those, meaning what? The minor sins. Another way that we see from this Hadith that um, there are minor sins, even though they're not mentioned, is that the Prophet said that a salawat al khams uh, the, fi the five daily prayers, the one Friday to the next, one Ramadan to the next Ramadan, will expiate. Will expiate whatever occurs between them. Right? If the major sins are avoided, what is left to be expiated? It has to be what? The minor sins. Right? So those are the two ways that we look at this hadith and understand from it that the Prophet is uh, alluding to the fact, indicating that there are major and minor sins. With that said, another question will come, will follow, and that is what distinguishes a major sin from a minor sin? How can they be distinguished? What is the difference, practically speaking, between a major sin and a minor, minor sin? Major sins, brothers and sisters, are generally considered those sins which, A, for which there is a prescribed punishment in this world. A prescribed punishment in this world. Any sin that a person does it, and there could, they could potentially be punished or penalized. There could be some punitive action taken against them in this world. That is considered a major sin. Example, a zina, adultery or fornication. Also, al qadf which is unsubstantiated accusation of profanity. You accuse someone of committing adultery or fornication with no uh, supporting evidence. Also, public intoxication, a person being drunk in public. That's also a sin which carries a penalty uh, in a, a prescribed punishment in Islam. But another uh, way that we say, or the scholars have typically determined a, a, a sin being, reaching the level of being a major sin, is that if there's a threat of punishment in the hereafter, any sin for which a threat of punishment has been made in the Quran or the Hadith in the hereafter for the one who commits that sin is considered a major sin. An example of that would be like backbiting, al ghiba or also tail carrying with a malicious intent, a namima Also dealing in usury, Akl riba, a person uh, dealing in interest or usury is also what? Something which Allah threatened punishment in the hereafter for that, etc. So these examples of what? Another way in which we determine or dub a sin to be a major sin. And then last but not least, uh, a sin whose perpetrator has been stamped with the curse of Allah or with his anger or threatened with punishment in hell. Okay, so these are, these are the three signs or indicators, any one of those three if a sin has any one of those three um, qualities or attributes or descriptions, 
fits one of those descriptions and is considered a major sin. All other sins are considered minor sin. Anawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, his statement where he said, qalu ulama min kulli them. I'm sorry, at-tawbatu wajibatu min kulli them. This statement that he makes where he said, the scholars have said repentance is obligatory from every sin or all sin. It makes it clear that whether the sin is considered minor or major, the ruling of repentance is one of the same, which means, and this is a common mistake that people make, it means that repenting from minor sins is just as obligatory as repenting from major sins. A lot of people think you don't have to repent from minor sins. No, you do. You have to repent from minor sins just like you repent from major sins. As, as I know, we is, is, that's what he's mentioning or alluding to. And so he's clarifying a huge misconception when it comes to the, the concept of repentance in Islam, that repentance is not simply reserved for major sins. Rather, it is something which encompasses both major and minor sins. Then he goes on and provides what? The ruling itself. The ruling of repentance, he says, yij, I'm sorry, or wajiba. It is obligatory, right? And this assertion is supported. This ruling that Anowi is giving for repentance from major and minor sins is supported by the Quran, by the Sunnah, and the Ijma' of Al Ummah, the Ijma' of the Muslim community, and the Ijma' of its scholars, right? As far as the Quran is concerned, we have the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which He says, And repent to Allah altogether, O believers, that you may be. Successful. This comes from uh, Surah An-Nur, the 24th Surah, verse number 31. If you notice in it, it contains what? A imperative, an amr, a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a command from Allah in the Quran indicates um, al-wujub. It indicates obligation, that we're obligated to repent. We also have the ayah um, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Istaghfiru rabbakum thumma, I'm sorry, Istaghfiru rabbakum thumma tubu ilayh. He says, seek your Lord's forgiveness and repent to him. Again, another amr, another command. And you'll find the Quran is full of commands to what? To repent. And so all these commands from Allah and the Quran indicate that what he is obligating us to repent to him when we sin. We also have the hadith collected by Muslim from the author on the authority of Al-Aghar ibn Yasar, Al-Muzani, in which the Prophet وسلم, he said, Ya ayyuha nas tubu ilallahi wa astaghfiru. He said, O people, repent to Allah and seek His forgiveness. For indeed, I repent to Allah 100 times each and every day. Notice in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ commanded us to repent. Command us to repent. Uh, and again, a command from the Messenger in the Sunnah, the primary ruling for it, unless we have evidence to the contrary, is that he's, in, is he's, he's ordering us and obligating us and mandating for us to do that thing that he has commanded. In this case, to repent. Last but not least, in Ijma' and know we, Rahimullah Ta'ala, in his book, Rawdat Al-Talibin, wa Umdat Al-Muftin, has transmitted the collective, unanimous consensus of the scholars regarding a tawbah that it is obligatory. He said, Rahimullah Ta'ala, in that work, he said immediate, immediate repentance from sin is, is a religious obligation as agreed upon by the scholars. And so therefore, um, repenting from major and minor sins is something which is required. Uh, and that, re that requirement is supported by the Quran, by the Sunnah and the Ijma' of an Ummah, the agreement of the scholars. Uh, with that said, brothers and sisters, we will um, stop here with our commentary on the preface, or a Noe's preface, to his chapter on repentance. And we'll pick up the discussion, inshallah ta'ala, tomorrow, try to uh, hopefully complete uh, the commentary, although it's somewhat uh, lengthy. Uh, if we're not able to complete it tomorrow, inshallah, the next day. And then we'll begin with the commentary on the hadith from the chapter of repentance. Until then, brothers and sisters, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless your houses, to bless your spouses, to bless your families, to bless you and to make you bless wherever you may be. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who listen to the talk and follow the best of it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who he teaches beneficial knowledge and to benefit us from that knowledge by making us from those who put it into practice. Hadu wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala bin Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.